Hello friends. Thanks for joining me for another virtual message during this COVID pandemic. Now today we're going to do something just a little different. We're going to take a look at an application of the message of Isaiah 58 in American history by one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, if you remember, for the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at Isaiah chapter 58, and specifically at a group of people who had divorced justice and mercy and righteousness from their religion. Fasting had been separated from a corresponding internal experience, and they were trying to merit God's favor through ritual alone without soul transformation or righting the wrongs that existed. And we also discovered the kind of fasting that God really wanted. And it was this, to demolish the systems that kept people in oppressive situations and set people free. Fasting was supposed to be an outward expression of an internal reality. Humility, sorrow for sin, deep seeking after God and his will, those were the things involved in what fasting was intended to be. And in Isaiah chapter 58, we find a nation of people that had divorced that from reality. So in this series, we are looking at what it means to be the church and to be a member of the church. And as we look at this today, I think you'll begin to see some connections even develop further in that idea. So with that in mind, let's pause for a moment and ask for God's guidance and direction as we spend this time together. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look into not only your word, but back into our church's history and into our nation's history and see where all of these things come together. So direct us and help us to see today what you would have us to as our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So it was January of 1862. The Civil War is beginning to ramp up and would continue for three and a half more grueling years. Now the South had a well-planned and determined rebellion process to help them maintain their rights, including the practice of slavery. Now, the North had underestimated the strength and resolve of the South to keep things as they were, and therefore they were largely unprepared for the rapid pace of secession in the southern states that ensued. Now, the North was proud, and many were asleep as to the true feelings of the southern states toward the North and the strength of their resolve to keep the status quo at any cost, that being slavery. Now, Abraham Lincoln has been in office for 10 months by this point in time and had run on a platform of keeping slavery out of the territories that had not yet become states. Now, here's a quote speaking to that very issue from one of the founders of our church from a book called Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, and this is from page 253. The author's name is Ellen White. And I quote, The South consider it perfectly right to engage in human traffic, to deal in slaves and the souls of men. They are annoyed and become perfectly exasperated if they cannot claim all the territory they desire. They would tear down the boundaries and bring their slaves to any spot they please and curse the soil with slave labor. <laughs> Quite a statement. Again, speaking to the idea of the territories that had not yet become states desiring that slavery would be able to continue in those places or spread to those places. The North, of course, wanted to keep slavery out of the territories and there you have the problem. Now, the issue to be decided, and I'll quote from uh, a website called Battlefields, and here's what they say. Here was the issue to be decided. Whether the United States was to be a dissolvable confederation of sovereign states or an indivisible nation with a sovereign national government. So that was the issue that was being decided. 
The South wanted slavery to expand in the territories, the North did not. And the inability to find a path through that divide led to the Civil War, at a cost of human lives nearly equal to all wars the U.S. has fought in combined. 625,000 lives lost in the Civil War. So at this point, 11 southern states have seceded from the Union and have formed a separate government under the presidency of Jefferson Davis. Now, a great divide has opened in this country and there seems little hope of restoring it except by force. And even that is tenuous at best. And now comes an additional challenge to an already problematic situation. There's a wrinkle in the fabric of morale in the North. I don't know if you've discovered this, but sometimes, as I have, and I'm sure you have as well, honestly, sometimes things seem to be one way but later you find out they are not what they seem. Such is the situation that happened to too many of the Union soldiers during the Civil War. Many Northerners enlisted under the belief that the war was to eradicate slavery, is what they've been told. And once enlisted, they discovered that the preservation of the Union was really what mattered. And here's another quote from that book, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, and this is from page 254. I quote, They find that they have been deceived, that the object of this war is not to abolish slavery, but to preserve it as it is. Continuing on, The feelings of thousands of our soldiers are bitter. They suffer the greatest privations. These they would willingly endure, but they find they have been deceived, and they are despirited. There is a sentiment expressed in this author's writings of this issue that borders incredulity. You just can't even imagine what is actually taking place, what is actually happening. And it kind of is like this. Leaders in the North are afraid to declare liberty to the slaves in the South because some Southern pro-slave states have not seceded, and making this step or this proclamation would cause them to join the rebellion. And they are afraid of the influence of anti-slavery men in the army's ranks who want to wipe out slavery once and for all because that will make the present situation harder. So if slavery must remain to preserve the Union, so be it. And within the Union Army itself, some leaders have strong sympathy with the South and maintain pro-slavery sentiments. Really, what they care about is preserving the Union and keeping slavery as it is. Now, many of the enlisted want to eradicate slavery. Others want it to remain but keep the Union. It is a perplexing situation and position to have an army so divided on why this war is happening. Now, if it's bad to have pro-slavery sentiments within the army and leading men of the war, it is equally bad and challenging to have such sentiments within the Congress and thus hinder the efforts to bring slavery to an end. But that's exactly what is taking place. So slavery is actually becoming kind of a backseat issue, and the main focus is preserving the Union. Slavery included, if need be, or as too many felt at the time, if possible. Now to make matters worse, some slaves manage to escape and seek refuge and freedom in the North only to be treated with contempt, put into a similar situation from what they have escaped, or, what's worse, mercilessly sent back to their masters to face inhuman punishment for escaping. Many who were half naked and half starved from their perilous flight to seek freedom were treated with disdain at best. 
And it is in this confusing, perplexing, and shameful state of affairs that these leaders of the nation call for nationwide fasts to entreat God to bring a speedy and good end to the war. Ellen White seeks for words, for expression, that sums this up. And she finds it in Isaiah 58, 5 through 7. Now she quotes this in the King James Version. I'm going to quote it from the NIV as we've been looking uh, thus far. Beginning in verse 5. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? As we see these issues developing within the nation at this period of time, these words of Isaiah begin to take on so much more meaning and weight. So speaking of the current state of affairs and of a religion devoid of love and justice and righteousness, Ellen White writes these words, Oh, what an insult to Jehovah. And then she quotes this line from Isaiah chapter 58, verse 2. And I'll be reading this from the New International Version. She, of course, quotes it from the King James Version. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. <laughs> and then quoting again from Isaiah 58 regarding the fast that God has chosen, she adds these lines from page 258 of this same book. When our nation observes the fast which God has chosen, then will he accept their prayers as far as the war is concerned. But now they enter not into his ear. He turns from them. They are disgusting to him. And it is this same church leader with the power of prophetic voice who called for anyone in membership within our church who held pro-slavery sentiments and would not renounce them from the heart to be quickly disfellowshipped. She called for every church member to vote in favor of prohibition when that was an issue in our nation and to do it on the Sabbath if that was the only opportunity you had. Some of our early church leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they ran stations on the Underground Railroad, which was against the law. They believed that the law of the land was in direct opposition to the law of God in regard to justice and their neighbor. And they felt compelled to assist slaves to freedom, no matter the cost. Many of our leaders were ardent abolitionists and engaged their voice and pen and means to call slavery to be abolished. And get this, they preached the three angels' messages found in Revelation 14 that is really a hallmark of the message of our church. They preached the three angels' messages within the context of of slavery and God's judgment on the nation if they would not repent and abolish this evil. Wow. That's the history of our church. I guess the question has to be asked, 
what happened? Because that's not really who we are today. So why do I bring all of this up? Why do I give this historical sketch and, and how the, the message of Isaiah 58 was used by one of our founders to speak to this very moment in our nation's history? Number one, to give a more recent historical application of Isaiah 58 by one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I really wanted you to be able to see this in a context that was a little bit more current. And two, to reveal that our church was active in social justice issues in its early years. And maybe, just maybe, to inspire us to re-engage in that in God-honoring ways. May God bless us as we seek to rediscover the idea of social justice being an integral part of our faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this brief moment in time that we could look back into our nation's past, a past that quite honestly we're not proud of. And we could see the application of this chapter that we've been looking at for the last several weeks and how it speaks so powerfully to that moment in time. And God, we, as we've listened, as we've looked at this period of time, we realize that you're also speaking to us today. And so I pray that you would give us courage and wisdom to find ways to apply this passage and this message in the here and now. And that you would help us to rediscover social justice in ways that honor you in our current sphere. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.